Now it is time for part two of our lecture on causes of the revolution. Today we're going to talk about the part, the lead up to the revolution that begins after the repeal of the Stamp Act. So if you remember the last time we had talked that the Stamp Act repealed because there was a boycott primarily that made England realize that we need our taxes but we can't stop our economic trade with the colonies and so they decided well we'll declare the declaratory act that we are going to repeal the stamp act but that we have the right to tax the colonies again in the future so the very next year we have a new prime minister his name is charles townsend and he promises to quote pluck the feathers of the colonial goose without too much squawking end quote and he just means that, look, I, we still need taxes from the colonies to pay off our war debts. And so we're going to tax the colonies in a way that they won't realize they're being taxed. That um, we will do, we'll go back to the Sugar Act, right? We'll go back to an external tax, um, not a direct internal tax like the Stamp Act was. And so the colonists won't see this tax on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we'll kind of trick them into paying the tax. So the Townsend Act is going to create a whole bunch of taxes that are externally assessed at the port. And these are going to be on many things like lead, paper, paint, most notably tea. We'll talk about that later. And so these taxes on a lot of consumer goods will be paid by merchants at the port. But then you, the colonists inside of Amer the American colonies at the stores, they won't physically see a tax because there's no stamp involved. All they'll know is just for some reason the prices of all consumer goods that went up for a little bit. And so we see that this is, like I said, an external tax. So what we have here is in this diagram is we see that um, the, the taxes are going to be assessed at the port um, by the merchants are going to pay them, and the taxes will be collected by revenue officers. Revenue just means taxes and money. And so the King of England and Parliament are going to uh, hire revenue offices in the colony, and these revenue officers will collect the tax at the port easy. Most colonists aren't going to see it. We're st England's still going to get their money. England thinks this, Charles Townsend thinks this is a good solution to our previous problems. Now, after we get our taxes from the revenue officers, then we're going to use that money to pay the royal governor's salary. So this is a new wrinkle in, in the history here. Um, and so in the past, if you were a colonial governor in Massachusetts or Virginia or Pennsylvania, what happened is the king would hire the governors but their salaries would be paid for by the, colo the colonies themselves, the colonial legislature. And this was a nice check and balance kind of thing, is that the king gets to have his say by picking the governor, but the colonies get to have their say by withholding the money, either some or all of the money of the governor if he's being a bad governor to the people. And so it seemed to work out pretty well in the past. But now, no, 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 the king and parliament want to make sure the taxes get collected and the people that are not, uh, that are not paying the taxes get punished. And so we're going to continue to use admiralty courts, which we talked about in the last lecture, and we're going to make sure that the government is no longer dependent on the colonies. He is now dependent on the king and these taxes that are being collected by these tax revenue officers. So he has an incentive to make sure that the taxes really get um, enforced and collected. So we have a change here in who controls the governor of the colony. So let's talk about number two, colonial response. And at the top it says that the colonists, even though Townsend didn't think this would cause such a stir, it's going to because it's cumulative, right? We don't forget our history. And so the colonists are seeing that their liberty, their freedom, their enlightenment rights of freedom and liberty and, and, and all of the things that they believe that, you know, representation with taxation and right, try to trill jury by your peers, all of those things are being threatened. So let's go through this, right? So we have a before and after, a change over time. So before, the era of salutary neglect ended, the governor was appointed by the king but paid for by the colonists, and we said that was a nice little check and balance thing. But now the governor is completely controlled by the, the king. He's appointed by the king, and he's paid by the king through these taxes. And so the people now have lost their executive branch of government. They don't control the governor at all. Next, right, let's talk about the judicial branch of government. In the past, in the colonies, during the era of salutary neglect, judges were elected by the people. Juries were composed of the people. But now that we see we're having these problems with Mother England, now we are using military courts, admiralty courts, where the judge is hired by the king and the jury is the judge. And so the colonists have no say in their legal branch at all. Right? They don't get to pick the judges. They're not on the juries anymore. And so we've now lost the judicial branch of government. 
Next, in the past, let's talk about the legislative branch of government, right? In the past, colonies would elect their colonial legislatures, like the House of Burgesses in Virginia. They would elect them, and then their elected representatives would pass taxes on them, pass laws on them. And if in Virginia or Pennsylvania or Massachusetts, if we didn't like what our elected representatives were doing, we could always vote them out of office. But now, of course, that is changing because Parliament is now passing taxes on the colonies. And if we've said that's taxation without representation, we have no way of telling Parliament not to raise taxes on us. And so we have lost part of our legislative branch of government. And so we see in all three branches of government, the colonists, things have changed. They are now out of power. And so they believe the Enlightenment at this point, that people have natural rights and should control their government. And so they see these Enlightenment rights are being taken away, and so they're very angry. So how do they respond to this? And so they think, okay, in the past, during the Stamp Act crisis, we um, created these non-importation agreements, these boycotts, and that really shook England up and convinced them that um, you know uh, they should get rid of the Stamp Act. So let's do that again. And so the Townsend Acts are passed, the colonists are mad about it, and so they start once again refusing to buy things made in England. And here we see this picture of this woman, instead of going and buying a dress in some store that came from England, now she's going to have homespun. She's going to make her own clothes. So she's being very patriotic here to the cause, right? And so we see that women are critical in this effort because not only should they not buy goods, they should enforce the boycott, but also they should make their own clothes for their family. And so this wouldn't have worked without women. Now, of course, we see the Sons of Liberty come back. If you remember during the Stamp Act crisis, the Sons of Liberty were made up of middle and lower class artisans and dock workers and farmers and things like that. And they were the more physical, violent, um, kind of in-your-face protest group. And so they assaulted people that didn't f follow the boycott, their fellow colonists. They also assaulted tax collectors and royal governors. And we see this is very effective because they're ruling through fear here. Um, and so if I'm a, um, I'm a regular colonist and I'm like, I don't know about the boycott, maybe I would like to buy something from England. Well, I'm not going to now because I don't want the Sons of Liberty to show up at my door. Or if I'm one of these um, royal tax collectors, revenue officers, I am not going to go collect the tax because I don't want the Sons of Liberty to burn my house down or tar and feather me. And so we see the Sons of Liberty are a very effective kind of scare tactic to make sure you're doing what's good for the colonies, not good for Mother England. So now we're, let's fast forward because this is going to continue kind of going on for several years in the colonies. So now let's go um, four years more in the future and let's go to the Boston Massacre. So to help the tax collectors collect their revenues, to protect the governors from the Sons of Liberty, England is going to decide to send troops, um, their regular military troops, to the colonies to protect uh, these royal officers and to make sure the taxes are collected. Um, and so these, these troops here, um, the army is supposed to be used to protect the people of England, not terrorize the people of England, not enforce the law on the people. That's, you know, that's the sheriff or judges or whatever, but it's not the military because they're trained to kill. And so the colonists, when they see these soldiers show up, and they know there's no war going on. They know they're here not to protect the colonists, but to kill them and to enforce the king and parliament's will. And so this causes all friction with the local people, you know, because these people aren't colonists. They're English people from England. And so, they, they, you know, and they're here to terrorize us and to enforce the law. And we don't want to pay the taxes and we don't want to follow the law. And so obviously there's going to be friction between the colonists and these armed people from England. So... We're going to go to Boston when this story starts. Obviously, it's the Boston Massacre. And we see that there's a group of these soldiers headquartered in Boston, and they're there to, like I said, protect the tax collectors, the governor, and enforce the taxes. Um, and so they are it's there. It's at night, and there are a couple of British redcoats, British soldiers that are there, and they're protecting at night uh, the revenue office, the place where taxes are, are collected. And so the Sons of Liberty... Um, know that this, you know, like they are mad about this. They don't want to have to pay the taxes. So a couple of people who are walking by, and we don't know if this is planned or not. It probably was by the Sons of Liberty. A couple of people are walking by these two soldiers stationed outside the tax house, and they start jeering and throwing insults at the soldiers. The soldiers get nervous because this attracts a crowd and more and more people show up. Um, and so what happens is um, they send for reinforcements, and the reinforcements show up, and so now there's a bigger group of soldiers protecting the, um, 
the um, the tax house. And so, of course, this draws a bigger crowd. And the crowd grows and it gets bigger. And, of course, with numbers, you get more tumultuous and you get angrier. And the soldiers are getting nervous. And then somebody yells fire. And we don't know who, right? Um, it may have been the soldiers. As you see in this picture, it looks like the officer right here is purposely giving the order to fire into a defenseless crowd. They have sticks and stones and they have snowballs and stuff like that, but they're not armed. Um, and these soldiers are. And if this is the case, if the officer himself yelled fire, then this is an act of murder. Um, it could be that somebody in the crowd yelled fire because to attract even more of a crowd out from their homes, because it's at night, um, the Sons of Liberty may have rung the local church bell, which was, a, which was a symbol in the night that, oh my gosh, get out of your house, It's time. there's a fire going on. And so that would have emptied everybody out of their house to see what's going on, so the mob grew. Um, and so maybe it was by accident that somebody yelled fire, like where's the fire, that kind of thing. In any event, somebody yelled fire, and so the soldiers fire into the crowd, because the soldiers are outnumbered and nervous, and we see five people in Boston are killed. And so now this is going to be called the Boston Massacre, which is in itself a form of propaganda, right? We have two accounts of the Boston Massacre. Here, this is going to be an engraving made by a patriot named Paul Revere, and he's going to draw this, and he's going to look like this was an act of murder, that the person yelling fire was the officer, and they purposely fired into a, a defenseless crowd. Over here, we see an English interpretation of the Boston Massacre, is we see these soldiers, they're just protecting themselves, right? The crowd is vicious and violent and, and large, and they're throwing stones at the soldiers, and they're about to club them. They grab the guns of the soldiers, and the soldiers were, fi were just firing in self-defense. And here's the officer here. He's down on the ground trying to be defended, and over here, he's actually upright giving the order. And so we have these interpreting... Of a kind of, we have these two interpretations of the Boston Massacre, right? And of course, if I'm a member of the Sons of Liberty, I'm for the colonies and I want to make the English crown look as bad as possible. And so that's why Paul Revere, a member of the Sons of Liberty, he engraves this image here and then they print it up and put it out there because it makes, it tells the colonist side of things and it makes the, the English look bad and they look like murderers, which are going to get more people excited and angry to join the Sons of Liberty and really, you know, enforce the Patriot cause here. All right. Another thing that happens as a result of the Boston Massacre, I mean, even the name, let's go on just a second, even the name Massacre, five people died, and that's horrible, but it's not a huge massacre with 20, 30, 100 people. And so Paul Revere and this guy named Sam Adams that we're going to talk about in a second, they are members of the Sons of Liberty, and they want to kind of put their own spin on it, and so they start calling it the Massacre to make it seem even bigger than it was. And so even the name itself is kind of a form of propaganda to get people to join your side. So here's Sam Adams that we've talked about before. He's one of the leaders of the Sons of Liberty. He is a brewer. Um, he's also a political leader at the time. And he's a great example of these middle class artisans and lower class stock workers that form up the Sons of Liberty. And he says we have to keep this excitement and this anger going about the British and their taxes and this massacre, not just in our colonies, but in all the colonies. And so he creates what we call the Committees of Correspondence. They're groups of men that are for the Patriot cause in all of the colonies up and down the Atlantic coast and they all believe in the patriot cause of not paying the taxes and then colonist rights and so they start writing each other um, back and forth, up and down. Correspondence means letters, talking about the latest things that the English are doing in the colonies to get people angry in all the colonies, to know this is not just a Massachusetts problem, it's also things happening in Virginia and South Carolina and New York, and it's really to kind of keep the pot stirring, right? To keep people angry as we wait for the next clash, the next event to happen. And that is going to be three years later in Boston again. Um, it's called the Boston Tea Party. Now let's take a minute to stop and think about this. Why Boston? Why the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party? And why are the Sons of Liberty starting in Boston? And the answer is pretty simple when you think about it. It's about economics, right? Most of the laws that England has passed have been taxing trade. And Boston is a major port. And the people in Boston, the richest people in Boston are merchants, and the lower class people make their money loading and unloading boats or building the boats. And so all of these taxes are going to have a much more disproportionate impact on the trade town of Boston. And so that's why we see that there's going to be so much protest in Boston. It's really the cradle of the revolution. In fact, today, you know, you have the New England Patriots, right? They're headquartered in the Boston area. And so we see that this, this feeling that we are the Patriots, we're the center of the revolution, takes a firm hold in New England.
And so it's 1773, and the story of the Boston Tea Party actually starts in England. So in England, one of the biggest companies in England that has the most employees and has a lot of members in Parliament actually investing in the company is the English East India Tea Company. And this India Tea Company, they obviously make a lot of their money growing tea in India and bringing it to Europe and to England and selling it. But there's been so much tea that they've brought in that the price of tea has dropped an incredible amount. And so the company isn't making profits anymore and they're about to go bankrupt. And so Parliament, who a lot of the members of Parliament are invested in this company, they say, we need to, we need to bail out this company. And so what they do is they say, what we're going to do is we're going to bail out your company. We're going to give you a monopoly of all the tea in the colonies. So they're the only company now that's allowed to sell tea to not just Boston, but to all the people in the colonies. And so they have a monopoly and, you know, it's going to raise their sales and hopefully sell the co save the company. But we know that things are not going so well in the, in the colonies. Um, and so to make the colonies happy, to not let a whole nother round of protests go on, we're going to reduce our tax on the tea. Remember the Townsend Act, there was a tax on tea. And so Parliament says, look, we're going to make sure the colonies are still going to get their tea and they love their tea. And even though it's only going to come from one company, um, we're going to make them happy because we're going to lower the tax on the tea. So how can they be upset? They're getting their tea and they're getting it for less. And so from Parliament's viewpoint, this is a win win. We're going to bail out the company and we're going to make the people in the colonies happy. But of course, they didn't reckon on Sam Adams, right? And the Sons of Liberty. Sam Adams believes that this is not just a ploy to bail out this big, powerful company. He believes it's a trick. He believes that the British are lowering the tax on the tea to trick us into relaxing our stance on we're not paying taxes because we're getting our tea cheaper and to get us to kind of accept this new idea that they can tax us and we're okay with it because we're paying less. It's kind of a, get, a trick to get us to buy our tea with the tax. And he says, Americans, don't be fooled. This is not, uh, England isn't trying to lower your tea taxes. They're really trying to just on the sly get you to real, get you to buy this tea with the tax and later on we'll raise the tax higher when you're used to paying this. When you're used to giving, saying it's okay for England to tax us without our consent. And so he he and the Sons of Liberty and the Committees of Correspondence write letters up and down the coast, try to get people to create some kind of organized protest against this tax on tea. And so in several colonies, not just Boston, but in Charleston and in New York and in Philadelphia, we're going to have this organized event where colonists come together, march on the boats that have all this tea from England, and break into the boats and dump the tea into our respective harbors. Now, the most famous, of course, of all these protests is in Boston. And so let's focus on that one. But it happens in many colonies. Um, and so they go to Boston um, as a mob at night. But it's kind of a controlled mob. It's this big group of Sons of Liberty. And they go up to the, the captain who has all this tea on board. And they, they knock on the captain's boat. And they say, hey, let us in. They're like, well, why do you want to come aboard? Well, we're going to destroy your cargo. And he's like, yeah, I don't think you can do that. And the mob says, I think we can. We outnumber you. And so he says, okay. And so this mob of people go on board. They calmly take the tea up from the cargo. They open it up and dump it into the harbor, making it, you know, undrinkable. Um, and so they're destroying thousands and thousands of dollars worth of East India Tea Company property and flouting the law, right? Destroying the tea because um, this is a, this is a target. This is a finger at the parliament, right? You want to tax our tea? Well, we'll just destroy the tea and not buy it. Um, and so this is an act of open defiance, right? We see in this picture this very famous uh, drawing of the Boston Tea Party, and you see these Native Americans. There were no Native Americans in the Boston Tea Party. A few colonists put a feather in their cap, and they said, hey, you know, we can always blame it on the Indians, but we know by now there are no Native Americans in any big numbers in Massachusetts anymore. Um, and so maybe we can just blame it on them. Um, and so this artist decided to draw that, so, you know, the, not to blame the colonists, but it was the colonists that were doing this. All right, and so now let's go to section C. So how does England respond to all of this defiance? How do they respond to the letters of the Committees of Correspondence? How do they respond to the, the violent acts of the Sons of Liberty? And of course, how do they respond to um, the dumping of the tea in all of these harbors? And so England is going to pass the Coercive Acts in 1774, the very next year. To coerce somebody means to force somebody to do something they don't want to do, right? And there's a whole bunch of them. Notice it's plural, acts. So we're going to talk about several of these. 
Um, now, when Sam Adams and the Sons of Liberty find out about these acts, they like, well, most people don't know what coercive means, and they're not going to get upset about a word they don't know. And so let's rename these acts. Let's call them the intolerable acts, which is if it's intolerable, it's something that is just horrible and you cannot stand, right? Um, and so that's kind of a better name for this if you want to get people angry and upset. And so we call them in America the intolerable acts. England called them the coercive acts. And so the first part of the coercive acts, or the intolerable acts, is the Boston Port Act. And Parliament says we're going to close Boston Harbor down until the people of Boston pay back the tea company for all the tea they destroyed. This will show them. This will teach them not to be rebellious children. Um, and so, of course, this is a death sentence for the people of Boston, you know, not not in reality, but metaphorically. It's because their economy is based off of trade. And so if you see these British warships here, if they're sitting in the harbor and they don't let any boats in, and they don't let any boats out, or else they'll blow them up, well, now all work ceases in Boston. And so the people who own the shipping companies are bankrupt. The people who work for the shipping companies are bankrupt. And so this plunges Boston into an economic depression. And it's meant to punish the people, but it just gets them more angry, and it makes them more unified in their hatred of Mother England. Next, we have the Quartering Act. That's the next part of the Coercive Acts. The Quartering Act is like, we have to keep troops in Boston to keep the peace, to force them to do these things, and why should we go into more debt to do that? The colonists are being mean and disruptive children, and so what we're going to do is we're going to force the colonists to quarter the troops. Quarter means to house the troops. And so if you have all of these British redcoats in Boston, instead of for the government paying to put them in a barracks and feed them, no, 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 that's going to cost us more money. And so they make the citizens of Boston house and put these troops in their homes and in their beds, and they make them feed them as well, give them room and board. And so that makes the colonists pay for this. And you can imagine this is a huge invasion of your privacy. Not only has the king made you lose your job in the Boston Port Act, but now he's going to make you house and feed these soldiers that are there to kill you and enforce the law. No, this is really going to get you upset. Next, we have the Act of Impartial Administration of Justice. That's a mouthful, right? So in England, that's what it's called. And of course, in America, we have to rename that to get people more angry, so we just call it the Murder Act. Yeah, it's a much more catchy name. And so the Murder Act, or the Act of Impartial Administration of Justice, says that if anybody who works for the king, be he soldier or tax collector or governor, anybody that's a royal employee, if they kill somebody... Um, or harm somebody in the colonies. We don't think they can get a fair trial in the colonies because the jury is going to be made up of colonists who will, of course, defend their fellow colonists. So what we're going to do is we're going to send anybody who works for the king who's been accused of a crime back to England to have trial there because we think it'll be a fair trial. There won't be colonists on the jury. Now, that may seem fair to people in England, but it doesn't seem fair to people in the colonies. That's why it's called the Murder Act. So you're telling me that a soldier working for the king could kill one of our citizens in cold blood and then not have to face a trial here in America. He could go back to England where they don't care about us and, and, and try to harm us. And of course, he's going to be found innocent. And so they're just going to get away with murder. And so we see this is really messing with our judicial system in America. And so this is also going to make us angry. And then the last one we have here is the Massachusetts Government Act. So no pithy name for this, right? It just says that, look, we don't trust the people of Massachusetts anymore. We think that their government is corrupt. It's controlled by these rabbles, these patriots, these people who don't care about the, the empire. And so we are going to shut down their colonial town halls and their colonial legislature because they can't be trusted with democracy. Now, of course, if you're an English citizen in America... Your two cherished rights are right to a trial by a jury of your peers, which we don't have anymore, and right to have elected government, which now has been taken away because your, your government has been disbanded. And we've talked about in this class that Massachusetts people, um, they or whether you're in Massachusetts or Rhode Island or any New England town, Town halls and democracy is something that's a part of your culture. You all have a town hall right there on the commons or the green. And so this is striking at the heart of who you are as a people. And so we see this political cartoon here. It's a very powerful and I think disturbing political cartoon. So it's, it's, we'll talk about the sourcing in a second. So here we see this Native American woman. And remember, we've said Native American women at this time and political cartoons represent the colonies. And so here she is being held down right, by members of parliament, and they're holding her down. This guy is looking up her skirt. So the implication is, is that England is about to rape us. 
Um, and that's going to, you know, that grabs your attention. And so it's not that they're really going to rape us, it's that they're metaphorically raping us of our rights. They're taking away our rights and our dignity and our government and our judicial system. And also, what are they forcing us to drink? Scalding hot tea down our throat. And so this is a, this is a real powerful political cartoon to shock you and to get you on the side of the colonies. Over here in the background, we see Lady Freedom, Lady Liberty. She can't look at this anymore. She's ashamed to see what's going on. And over here, the people of England are just pointing and sneering and, and er, egging them on. Um, and so this is where we are, right? And so if we were to source this, we would say that the audience is probably colonists who are kind of undecided about what whose side to take England's or the and, or the colonies and so this is designed to shock them into supporting the side of the colonists by showing this this rape scene here all right, so 1774, now things are starting to heat up and go quicker now. The more England starts to persecute the colonies, the more it kind of forces them together as 13 colonies and makes them more united in their descent. And so we have the first Continental Congress in 1774. Notice 12 colonies show up. In the past, during the Stamp Act Congress, it was just nine, but now we have quite a few more. And so that kind of proves the point. The more serious things get between the colonies in England, the more they come together and try to talk about their mutual reaction, their mutual response. And so 12 colonies show up, um, and so their goal is to try to figure out how we can peacefully get England to realize that they need to stop this, right? Not everybody in America is a patriot or a son of liberty um, and want to violently oppose this. Not everybody, and in fact, most people in America are not talking about independence or revolution at this point. They just want to shake England up and say, would you stop doing this? Go back to neglect. We loved you when you neglected us. Um, and so that's what they're going to do. And so they start to do some of the things they've always done before. Um, they create continental associations, which are, of course, the people that are supposed to enforce the boycott, the non-importation agreements. It's worked in the past. Maybe if we boycott again, that'll work. Next, they're going to start collecting military supplies. This is a just-in case, right? We're going to extend the olive branch, our handshake. Please, peace. But if they're not going to shake our hand, then let's get our fist ready. Let's, let's get ready for war, just in case they want to attack us. And so we're going to talk about this at the end of this lecture and so they start collecting gunpowder they start collecting muskets there are no there are no military um, arsenals in the colonies there's no factories to produce these things so we better start saving them up just in case England starts to attack us Next, they agree to meet again, right? They, they send letters to the king. They say, please stop. And they say, if you don't help us, we will have a second Continental Congress next year where we try to figure out what to do if the king is ignoring us. And that is the more famous Continental Congress, as we'll find out. And that one meets for years, not just one time and done. And so now let's finish up our, this set of notes by talking about the last major event. It's the battles of Lexington and Concord. Um, and so what we see here, let's kind of set the stage, some historical context. The British troops are in Boston. We know that they've been quartered there even since before the Boston Massacre. Now, the leaders of the Sons of Liberty are two guys that we need to focus on right now. One we've already met, Sam Adams, and the other one we're meeting now. His name is John Hancock, probably the richest person in America at the time. And he runs a shipping business, and he's really been impacted by all of the closure of the Boston port and all of these taxes. And so it's not safe for Sam Adams and John Hancock to be in Boston where they normally are because the British would arrest them, being the Sons of, the Li of Liberty. And so it's not clear, but um, we think... Um, the British are saying, we think the leaders of this revolution, this like proto-revolution, before revolution, we think Sam Adams and John Hancock are either in Lexington and Con or Concord, these little towns kind of west of Boston, and so we need to go find them, because if we arrest them, maybe this whole, you know, all these problems will go away. Also, the British know that the colonists have started to store military weapons, gunpowder and guns, and so we really want them out of the hands of the colonists, because we don't want them to kill us with it, and so we also think those are in Lexington and Concord. So the British hatch a plan to, in the middle of the night, march down to Lexington and Concord, arrest these people, and um, take their, we their weapons away from them, kind of stopping the revolution before it starts. Now, the colonists have spies in Boston, and so they found out that this plan is going to happen. But the problem is, we don't know the day, the night that they're going to launch this raid, and we don't know the route they're going to take. Because there's two ways out of Boston, as you can see in this picture. You can go down the neck of Boston, this little thin kind of 
of peninsula that it sits on and then go around to the main road, which would take a lot longer. Or you can just get on boats and st go straight across the Charles River into Charlestown, and that gets you right to the main road. And so, of course, if we're Sam Adams and John Hancock, we need some notice and we need to move the guns and our leaders if they're going to take the shorter route. Um, and so they station spies in Boston and they have a plan, right? And so once these troops are on the move, um, we need to let the patriots outside of Boston know that this is the night and which route they're taking. And so they have this plan worked up. And so the tallest, um, the tallest, um, building in Boston is this church. It's called the Old North Church. And at the top of the church, at the spire, we have a bell tower, and it's and you can really see a long ways around. Um, and so on the night that the British are supposed to leave Boston, a spy in Boston is supposed to go up to this top of the church tower, and he's supposed to put two lanterns up, or one lantern up, one if by land, two if by sea, and that basically lets the people know which route the British are taking. And so sure enough, right, it's, it's it's a nighttime. We see everybody kind of spies around Boston and they see um, two lanterns go up in the church tower. So they know that the British are taking the more direct route. They're going across the Charles River. So one of these spies who's just hanging out outside of Boston is our good old friend Paul Revere who made that picture. And he's standing there kind of just, you know, trying to stay warm. And he sees the two lanterns. He's like, oh my gosh, this is the night. So he gets on his horse along with a couple other men and they ride like a bat out of hell at night going through every village along the way shouting that um, you know that the troops are on their way right so you know look out they're going to be invading us hide you know hide your women hide your guns um, and they get to Lexington and Concord hours before the British do and so they warn um, they warn John Hancock and Sam Adams to get out of there they move all the guns out of the way before the British get there and of course there's this very fam famous poem by Washington Irving that talks about this and he said that Paul Revere right rid through the night rode through the night yelling the British are coming, the British are coming, which he did not do because that would be like saying, we're coming, we're coming. And everybody considered themselves British at this point. That wouldn't have made sense. So anyway, so he gets to Lexington and Concord. Everything's fine. The leaders have been warned ahead of time. The guns are gone. And so the British now, not knowing that this is happening, they're making their slow march outside of Boston, across the river, and then up through this, this road. Now, there's 700 British troops, and it takes a long time to move 700 British troops. So they march all night long, and when it's finally morning, right, they reach Lexington. This first town, this first New England town they're going to go to, to look for the leaders of the revolution and um, the, the supplies. And of course, they don't find anything. All they find on the village green is a whole bunch of militia members, people from Lexington and surrounding towns who were there to symbolically say, you cannot search our town, get out, we have rights. You're not going to search our houses. Um, they're, they're not intending a fight. They're just there to let the British know that, you know, we're serious about this. But the British troops don't know that. And so the British troops get into battle formation and they say, disperse ye saucy fellows, which is a saucy fellow is just like a, a ne'er-do-well, a rogue, a, just a, a, a criminal, right? Um, and so the colonists are like, no, and then like, okay, we should probably go. We don't want to die. And so a couple of the militia members, the regular citizen soldiers, they're about to leave uh, Lexington Commons. And then somebody, once again, this seems to be a problem in the 1700s, yells fire. And again, we don't know if it was the officer, but somebody did. And so then the British troops just open up and it's a slaughter because these are heavily trained and equipped British soldiers, they're professionals, versus a bunch of militia members, which are just farmers that have a gun in their hands. And so the militia members just run away like crazy. They don't want to die. But there are some casualties. Now, of course, in American history, we talk about this being the shot heard around the world. It's the start of the revolution. Um, because this is the first example of serious armed conflict between armed colonists and armed British soldiers um, and sort of a battle. Um, and so we, we traditionally say that this is the start of the American Revolution. Um, and so, you know, the British don't find anything. They search the town. Everybody's long gone, the leaders and the, and the, and the weapons. And so they then get in their formation and go on to Concord. Um, and they look at Concord, and again, it's the same situation. There's nobody there. Um, there's, no soldiers, there's no militia members on the commons anymore because they're like, oh my gosh, we don't want to die. And so the British are kind of looking around town, and they send some troops up a, across a bridge and like, oh no, there's nobody here. Now there are, there are some soldiers there, some militia members there, and they do start to open fire from behind trees and rocks. They're fighting, quote, 
quote-unquote Indian style like they've been taught on these wars with the French. Um, and so the British are like, oh, we got to get out of here. We don't know how many there are, and they're hiding behind things. And so the British come back to Concord Commons, marshal up, and they start their march back to Boston, which is several miles. Now, the British are in these nice, beautiful red uniforms that might well be a target on your back. It stands out in the countryside. Everything's green, but these guys are red. And there are these nice straight formations, which make them easy to see. And so by now, the call has gone out to militia members all around the Massachusetts area that, you know, grab your gun, grab your son. You know, the British have, uh, the British troops have invaded our town. Um, and they've killed our citizens. And so these are known as Minutemen, right? They're just regular farmers, militia members that are supposed to be ready at a minute's notice to defend their liberty. And so it must have been a long, deadly march back by the British because in the middle of the day now, they're in these nice tight formations and their red coats um, and th for behind, you know, every so often behind a tree or a stump or a stone fence, you'll hear pop, 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 right? And those are militia members just picking off the British soldiers easy, right? Like a turkey shoot. And the British soldiers stop their march, turn around to return fire, but by then the militia members have left, right? They've gone on to go further down the road to attack them. And these are hundreds of people now. Um, and so it's a pretty murderous route back by the British soldiers. There's 270 casualties of the British. So 700 British soldiers count go out. 270 of them are either killed or wounded by the time they get back to Boston. And so, you know, this is such an important event because it really marks the beginning of armed conflict between the colonies and Mother England. And so we call it the start of the revolution. And so if we look at our learning objectives here, the most important things to take away. It says, in what ways, in what new ways did England attempt to raise revenue? And so that's all the Townsend Acts, right? And the, you know, in, enforcing with the revenue collectors and trying to get um, the governors to be paid by these taxes to make sure they get collected. And so it's kind of the second round, if you will, of taxes. All right. Next, it says, describe the various additional arguments the colonists used against taxation. Um, and so once again, we hear the cry of no taxation without representation. We hear that uh, the, the English have now taken away our courts. The English have taken away our government. The English have shut down our ports, right? Everything England does becomes yet another reinforced or new argument to try to get people in the colonies to become patriots and fight against Mother England. Number eight, identify the political and economic actions the colonists took to protest English taxation. We have the Boston Massacre, when we have the forming of the Sons of Liberty, we've got the Boston Tea Party, right? We've got the First Continental Congress, we've got people arming themselves, all of the things we've talked about. Number nine, to what extent were the colonies united in their opposition to English taxation by 1775? Well, as I had said, the First Continental Congress, 12 colonies show up. That, so that shows growing colonial unity. But I also said that not everybody in the colonies is as upset about this. Certainly people in New England are, because Boston has been the most affected by this, and maybe other port towns up and down the coast and other colonies because they depend on trade. But a lot of the people in the south or the interior they haven't been as affected by this, and so the colonies are in no way united as a group, 100% in support of taking this drastic step of thinking about revolution. And that is it for our lecture on the lead-up to the revolution.